um, Beacon Academic Forum, replacing superstitions with science. Um, the first thing I want to do is actually thank Carrie for all the work that she's done with our PowerPoints and doing the clicking and all that. I mean, she's been a really great help. If you could just give her a quick round of applause. <laughs> For this forum to work well, we need uh, basically two things, your input and your cooperation, basically. So what we'll do is we'll ask some questions after the panel goes. We'll get about five minutes per presenter uh, for questions, and then we'll move on to the next presenter, because we have to be out of here by 3 o'clock, okay? So without any delay, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel here. The first presenter is Caroline Lee. She's going to be... Presenting historical and current political decisions based on omens and superstitious beliefs. Next, we have Dr. Andrea Brody. <laughs> Dr. Brody will briefly examine the treatment of mental health and other neuroscience issues throughout history. The next presenter is Professor Sandy Novak. Professor Novak will be presenting the evolution of advertising design and with samples of print of television commercials as well. And, uh, following Dr. Uh, Professor Novak will be Dr. Kurt Stowe. <laughs> Dr. Stowe is going to discuss faith, creationism, and evolution. So that should be interesting. And lastly, but not final, of course, uh, is Dr. Kevin Chandler. Dr. Chandler will be presenting examples from the world of mathematics and logic to help us understand better our beliefs if they're based on correct thinking. So without any other delay, Professor Lee.
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Connections 
New medications, mental health links to heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, sleep disorders, etc. Um, continue. So we have come a long way from superstition to science. Learning differences were once considered a mental illness. People with learning differences were categorized as developmentally delayed, or what was once called retarded. We now know this to be completely false. In uh, 1877, the term word blindness is coined in Germany. No evidence of visual or intellectual difficulties were associated with it. In 1887, German, uh, a German physician uses the word dyslexia for the first time to describe very great difficulty in interpreting written or printed symbols. In 1963, the term learning disability is used for the first time at a conference in Chicago. 1969, Congress passes legislation that mandates support services for students with LD. In 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act mandates free, appropriate public education for all students. In 1990, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, IDEA, uh, it was a renaming of the former legislation, replacing the word handicap with disability, and autism and traumatic brain injury are added to the eligibility list. <clears throat> 1996, researchers at uh, the National Institute for Mental Health used functional magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, to examine living brains to identify the regions of the brain that behave differently to people with LD. LDL Online is the first web resource for parents and teachers seeking ways to help students with LDs. Yale University in, in 2005, researchers identify a gene that has pattern, patterns and variations that are strongly associated with dyslexia. And today, many organizations such as the National Research Center on, on Learning Disability continue to, to conduct important research on the causes, interventions, therapies, medications, and accommodations to help those with LDs. It's very much a work in progress. So we certainly come a long way from superstition to science. And stay tuned because it's not over yet. Thank you. Um, I want to say that um, how can we like prevent people from going to asylums if they are not mentally challenged by their own appearance? Because it's possible that some of them cannot even be at the asylum because they need their loved ones to be beside them instead of being alone by themselves. I mean, that's when the mentally mind gets worse. How do we prevent that? That's a good question. I would ask you to answer it for me. No, but, well, I think, you know, suicide is mostly number one proposition that I think no one don't wants to be in. I mean, for myself, I just talked about a lot of things in my life about certain things that I struggled through for certain things. And then, if, you know, some per people don't want to commit suicide. They need help instead of just being rejected by their loved one because the loved one has to take care of that person instead of just having that person to go with, with a stranger that that person might not be comfortable with. I think, um We've heard many stories about families who believe in their loved ones and are able to advocate for them strongly. Um, here's a famous case of uh, Temple Grandin, who, whose mother advocated for her for a lifetime. And he, even against all odds, when people were labeling uh, Temple as uh, not retrievable or not rehabilitatable. She turns out to be an extremely brilliant uh, human being who, who, with the help of a loved one, was able to realize success. So we're hoping that families and loved ones can advocate for them. All right. Anybody else? Um, is there any biological effect of pretending that sort of encourages the superstition? Is there any the best I can say is that people survived it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they survived, and their, their skulls healed over, and there are numerous uh, illustrations of, of people who had multiple uh, yeah. sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Survivability, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, oh, yes. We have one more. Oh, sorry. Um, 
crispy paraffin hearts, orange stars, yellow moons, even white diamonds. With this delicious frosted on tin, we're going to have a great breakfast. Well, I got it. inside a tree. Can anybody guess who they are? Keebler. That, the Keebler? Elves. elves. That's right. The Keebler Elves. And um, as you can see on the box, they're in this case called Townhouse Crackers. And something you might not know is that the, t the name Townhouse was chosen for a very specific reason. Um, historically, a townhouse was owned by a wealthy family who also had property in the country. So the family would um, move into town during the grand social season, and then they would return to the countryside for the sporting season, fox hunting, and so on. So when I show you the next commercial, you'll see the obvious magical overtones, but I want you also to look for that underlying message about wealth and riches that is associated with this idea of a townhouse. Okay. Aha! Set it down gently, fellas. That explains it, Gabriel. Yeah. Right. What? The buttery taste of your townhouse crackers. I knew there was a logical explanation. Yes, sir. Health and magic. Right. That's why Gabriel townhouse crackers taste so rich and buttery. Just health and magic. Right. Well, I'll let you out get back to work. <laughs> Keebler townhouse with a rich buttery taste. And now low salt townhouse. Same buttery taste with only half the salt. In advertising, really, nothing's accidental. The townhouse crackers were named to associate the product with quality, status, and wealth. Now, the notion of superior products is illustrated in our next commercial as well. Uh, let's now look at a new dishwashing liquid that can make dishes more than clean. <laughs> doing? Looking for the name of my time? No, I'm looking at myself. You like what you see? I sure do. I can see myself in this place. And this glass. And the silver. You've discovered some way to make dishes shine. Discover something new. Now I wash them the way you should. Enjoy. That's right. You can take real pride in your dishes. Joy gets dishes more than clean. You gotta see yourself shine. You know, in my mind, there's clean and there's not clean. But when we get on to the idea of more than clean, super clean, it really translates in this commercial to confidence, intelligence, and well-being. And the product is literally a reflection of the consumer and how her dishes are a product of her modern ingenuity. The supernatural properties of products are not just limited to retro commercials. As time marches on, the age of technology brings with it a belief that almost anything is possible. Take a look at how a commercial can revolutionize a sponge on a stick by injecting it with science and technology. This is a Scrubbing Bubbles Lab, where Scrubologists have developed new heavy duty fresh brush max. The reusable end attaches to disposable pads, packed with powerful cleaners, making it a better way to really clean. Watch how the science of Scrubbing Bubbles tears through tough stains for a clean, better than even Clorox solid bond. Say goodbye to tough stains. Say hello to clean. New Scrubbing Bubbles Fresh Brush Max. We will call so you don't have to. Essie Johnson Family Company. <laughs> and it has to be true because the scrubologists say so. <laughs> so um, advertisers don't just sell products, they sell experiences too. Airline travel is a great example. The airlines know that they can get you physically from point A to point B in pretty much the same way. But their challenge is to convince you that the experience will be uniquely better when you travel with them. Look at how the next commercial touches on an existential theme. Freedom. Here you go, Billy. From day one, Bill has been told where to sit. Billy, this will be your seat. 
know you would be sitting here. You're in 38 E. And that's when Bill decided, hey, I don't want to be told where to sit anymore. So Bill switched to Southwest Airlines. Now Bill sits where Bill wants, free to choose on Southwest Airlines. are using supernatural motif, motifs or at least unrealistic promises that um, my generations have been growing up with for a long time. We've been influenced by them whether we like to admit it or not. But advertisers are dealing with a new generation, you, the millennials. You were born in te te into technology and you are your own tastemakers. You are the web 2.0. You are the social media generation. You're not impressed by celebrity endorsements like my generation was. You're more likely to respond to your friends on Facebook or reviews on Amazon. You're informed, you're connected, and you're mobile. You expect the ease of technology in everything that you do, and advertisers are scrambling to figure you out. So let me end with this question. How do you think a present-day advertiser can best reach your generation? I heard a couple. Anybody have any ideas on that subject? You could go into advertising. Yeah. <laughs> I think the best way to reach us is to give us an immediate result. Search evaluation is less um, patient because we have technology now that gives immediate results. Your generation has to go through books, go through research, just get an answer. Now we just type on the internet. That's the best way to reach us. Give us what we want now. Give us what we want now. Does that sound familiar, teachers? <laughs> give us what we want now. Good, good answer. And, re and very real answer. Other thoughts? Okay. In that case, I am going to pass the mic on to Dr. Kirk Stowe. Not quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to use the mic. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Today I'm going to talk on the fact and theory of evolution, replacing superstition with science. So, when we're talking about superstition, we're talking about creationism, okay? In the U.S., what does creationism mean? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah. We, were, we came from a divine entity. We came from a divine entity, Adam and Eve, typically. That's what creationism is in the U.S., the Judeo-Christian belief. So that means there, there was a God, or there is a God, okay? Evolution does not deny that there's a God, but doesn't prove that there's not a God either, okay? Creationism in the U.S. was that we, the universe was created in six days, and the seventh day God rested. But there are many creation myths throughout the world, okay? It just so happens that the, the Christian uh, creation myth, or creation idea is most prevalent in the U.S. So faith. What is faith? What is faith? <laughs> yeah. I can tell you what faith is. <laughs> to show you up on the screen. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll let you click it. Well, it's a firm belief in something that there's no actual proof or evidence for. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with faith. But it's different than science. Firm belief in something for which there's no proof or evidence for. A complete trust. Okay? Faith in your mate, faith in God, those are both good things. 
What differentiates faith from science, though? Well, it's evidence. Faith, you have no evidence except for internally. <coughs> science, you have evidence externally. How do we gather evidence? We use the scientific method. Okay? Does anybody know what the scientific method is? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Does anybody uh, have an idea? Of course, Tyler. Oh, Tyler. So, <laughs> scientific method is pretty much asking a question and trying to prove yourself right or wrong to see how it works and the end result. Do we prove anything in science, Tyler? We can't prove nothing. Be proven. Right. Okay. Yes. Very good. So the attacks on evolution by, by modern creationists are that evolution is only a theory, okay? Evolution, we'll talk about evolution as a theory and as a fact. And the other um, attack is that modern creationists are working scientifically, but they're basing their, their work all on assumptions. The assumptions are developed from the Bible. Okay, so let's talk about a theory. <clears throat> the popular idea of theory is that there's a hierarchy of confidence from fact to theory, a hypothesis, and guess. Okay, what are the differences between fact and theories? Well, some equate the fact of evolution with the theory concerning the mechanism. The facts are that evolution has occurred. We can demonstrate that by evidence that I'll give you. The theory are constructs that explain and interpret the facts. So the mechanism of evolutionary change is by natural selection. So that's the theory of evolution. The fact that it's occurred, and then the theory of explaining how it has occurred. Okay. Facts do not disappear when we have disputing theories. For example, when Einstein disputed Newton's theory of gravity, do we fall off the earth? No, right? The fact of gravity is a fact. Okay? And in fact, many creationists accept microevolution, which is evolution within the species, which I'm going to talk about today, and reject macroevolution, which is change from one species to another species, which I'm going to talk about today, too. So one makes evolutionary biology a science rather than a faith. Well, it's falsifiable. It's open to public observation, and it posits only natural causes. That's what makes it a science. It posits only natural causes, not supernatural causes. The main classes of evidence for evolution are direct observation of small-scale evolution in nature, artificial selection experiments, and natural variation. Homology, or structural similarities among groups of organisms, also speaks to evolution, and the fossil record. Transitional forms and order of appearance of organisms. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is op direct observation, observation of evolution in nature. This is a moth, Viston ventularia, and it used to look like this, white with black speckles, until the Industrial Revolution, where England started burning coal, and the tree bark turned black, and it evolved into a black form here. Artificial selection. This is where you take part of a population, like this part here, and select it for the breeding population, and the mean of the population moves in one direction. Okay. Here's an example of that. Dogs. All came from wolves. And the vegetables, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli and kale all came from Brassica oleracea, which is a common wild mustard, but they look very different. 
cauliflower looks very different than cabbage. Okay, natural variation. At any, at any single place or time, a species is distinguishable from another species. So it appears in distinct forms. But when you go over space or over time, those distinctions disappear. And here's an example, the goal, or the arc, I call it the Arctic goal. There's many names for it. But it's a ring species across the Arctic, and between each population, they can breed. But when they meet right here, they can't breed. So it defines a species, something they can't breed with, with another individual, right? So in fact, these two are distinct species, but all the way around the ring, they breed. Homologies. The humerus in these tetrapods is all the same. So the human, the horse, the cat, the bat, the bird, and the whale all have a humerus. They all have ulna as well. Okay, we can identify those bones. And they come from the same embryological material. So that suggests a common ancestor. Okay. Imperfections and homology. Evolution lies exposed not by the nearly perfect adaptation, because perfection could be imposed by a wise creator, but instead in the imperfections that report the history of descent. Okay? So here's an example. A snake. Why does a snake need a pelvic girdle? We don't know why. It has no legs, but it's got a pelvic girdle with rudimentary legs on it. Anyway, just like the human. Okay, transition in the fossil record. You can see the small horse, very small, to the modern day horse. And if you look on the left hand side, you can see that the small horse has digits, and the digits successfully disappear into a hoof. <laughs> so what are the main classes of evolution evidence that we see? Direct observation, homology, and fossil record. And I'd like to leave you with this. You will never get morality out of science, and you never get science out of religion. And I'd like to ask you that question. What do you think about that? I knew you could answer the question. Actually, you can, I believe you can get science out of religion. You think so? Yes. Okay. Because in the human body, there is a DNA structure that holds our entire body together. And I actually looked this up, I Googled it to be sure. No, I'm, I'm not BSing this, guys. That it is in the shape of a cross. In the shape of a cross? Yes. I've never seen that. You have to give me the link for that. Yeah. In the it's shape the of entire, a cross. It's, it's the entire, OK, let me put it to you this way. You know how you have the foundations for a home? put the concrete down, Right. it's the entire, this thing holds your entire body together without it, your lungs, your heart would not be able to hold, hold together. Okay. So there is a way that you can use religion or faith in <coughs> science. So. Are you emailing it to me? I can do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested in reading that. Yeah, Tyler. It was cool. I'd say to get moral out of science, saying science, we can't learn things like religion teaches us, probably do the right thing, do something ethical. Absolutely. And that but science can only give us what is, um, like, give us an answer we want for now. That's the difference between the two. Right. Science won't give us morality because you know from the entomology class when we talked about all the crazy things that go on with insects and stuff like that. Precisely. Um, insect rape and incest and stuff like that. that 
we as humans believe is morally wrong. And you can't get that from science, because if you look at biology, animals do it. And what makes us different than animals? Well, somebody would say a soul or something like that. But, um, so we can't get morality out of science, per se. And you can't get science out of religion. Dr. Stowe, so we got two questions right here. Let's go with this gentleman here first. I was just going to say you can't test the hypothesis about that. Hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right. I'll talk really loud. <laughs> well, should I turn this mic off? It should be on this one. Yeah, we're going to turn this. <laughs> Guan Yin, hello. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try it this way. Um, it's on, so maybe that's helping a little better. Um, what I'm going to take a look at is uh, just numbers, and, and what we find is uh, a lot of people um, have a lot of trouble uh, comprehending a lot of numbers. Um, I do myself. That's just universal. Um, and if we can get a good sense of the numbers, then we can start taking a look at situations that maybe are confusing, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those. But maybe we can start nailing down um, what's superstition and what's actually science and what's real. So what is probability? <coughs> um, probability is, is defined, and you knew this was going to turn into a math lecture, right? Probability <laughs> <laughs> is defined as the number of possible outcomes of interest uh, divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And you notice the words that I have highlighted there are possible. They have to be possible in order to uh, actually calculate what a probability is. And I think, particularly in the um, media, the popular media, they throw around the word probability, not meaning this. And they actually put numbers to it that, um, to be honest with you, they're just making up. So let's look at an honest example. What I have is a, a fair die. And why it's a fair die is because um, if I roll it, it has an equal probability of falling on each or any of the sides, right? There are six sides to it. On each of the sides, there's a dot or a number of dots. Um, this side has one. But one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. So if I want to calculate what's the probability of throwing a two, well, number of possible outcomes of interest, there's only one side.